it's winter and I need more socks. So I'm going to make some right along with you so that we can all have warm socks. These are basically the socks in my book, Sockinations, but simplified and using the shaped toe by decreasing option that's at the end of the book. Here's the yarn I'm using. It's one of my top favorites. Opal sock yarn, mostly wool, some polyamide. It has wonderful memory and it knits well on the machine. I will be specifically knitting for size six and a half feet. Alternate row counts are given as text overlays on the film. For other sizes, you can consult the charts in this book and get an enormous range. For this simple style, we're going to begin with a zigzag row in waist yarn and hang the comb end weights in the waist yarn. That will allow us to start right into the sock without trying to make ribbing and turn the ribbing and rehang part of it on one bed. That's the part of sock making so many people find extremely challenging. We'll go right into the sock and hand finish the top later. So with both beds set for stockinette and a small stitch size, knit a zigzag row, hang the comb and weight. Now set up for tubular knitting. On this machine, it's the green button. On a brother, it would be one part button on each bed. On a studio, it would be done with alternate levers on each bed. Passips are CX, CX. Other, more modern superbas are the arrow circle keys. So adjust to a stitch size that'll knit stock and knit and knit two rows carefully. Now you can more quickly knit several, usually about 20, waist yarn rows. Remember, since we're knitting a tube, every number on the counter is really only half of a complete circuit. So we want at least an inch of knitting. Now change to the main yarn. I like to knot a little loop and hang it on the first needle. M me, the right hand needle on the back bend works best and set the row counter to zero now. On this machine in this yarn, stitch size 6-6 six, six gives me the gauge and the fabric I want. So that's how it is set. And now we're going to knit the entire sock top tubular. Periodically, you will see me stop and adjust the yarn. That's because I sometimes notice the end stitch is getting tight. I'm being extremely naughty and knitting straight from the center pull ball. And in this yarn, that often works well. But if there's a little too much resistance, that end stitch will get tight and you'll see me reach down to release a little bit of yarn. I am making fairly short sock tops at 120 rows. You may lengthen them or shorten them without ruining the pattern, but what you may not do is create knee socks from this pattern unless the wearer has exceptionally slender calves. There isn't any shaping built in for the normal increase in size from ankle to calf muscle in this design. If we knit until the row counter reaches 120, we will be, have between five and six inches of sock top. Opening the bed to look down in, this is what you see. That's the tube your leg will go into. Now we want to knit the heel. I prefer to knit the heel on the back bed. So cancel all keys on the front bed and set the back bed to knit normally every row. On this machine, that's the red key. It might be in or stockinette on other machines. Here comes the most challenging part of this kind of sock, and that's short rowing the heel. It is essential to hang plenty of weight on the heel fabric because as it grows in the center, while we shape it, it makes a pouch of knitting that likes to pop up off the needles, and that extra weight helps us control the downward pull on the fabric so that it doesn't pop off. What I am showing you here is the automatic wrap method. If you prefer other methods of short rowing and already know them, you can substitute it. It won't change the pattern in any way except a slight difference at the look where the heel stitches join the ankle stitches. But I'm doing automatic wrap because it's slightly simpler to keep up with and we want these socks to be easy. 
It's handled by knitting across the entire row, then putting a needle in the hold on the carriage side, knitting back, and again putting a new needle in to hold on the carriage side. If you see me pause, it will be because I'm reaching under the machine to move the heel weights. It is absolutely essential that they be pulling down most right on the last couple of needles and the first couple of needles to knit in every row. That's where the trouble arises if it's going to. Some machines are less fussy about this than others. These old superbas are quite exacting. You really need your weights placed correctly. And this is what I mean by correctly. You can see the downward pull in the right area and that only the back fabric has the weights inserted into it. If it's in the front as well, the pull down won't be adequate. The weights you see me using are the heavy forks that I show you how to make in my book, Cheap Tricks and Cool Tools for Machine Knitters. I like them far better than anything else I have. When I invented the way of making them, I was actually trying to imitate pass-up heel grips, which are excellent, but I like these even better. What is rarely adequate for one of these old Singer Superba machines is claw weights. They just don't have enough heft to do the job we really want. This process is called short rowing in or short rowing down. And on this occasion, I'm going to short row in for 22 rows. Only nine stitches will be left in work on the shortest row. As soon as the shortest row is knitted and the final needle placed in the hold, we will begin short rowing out, which lengthens the row by one stitch every row. On the very same row as we place the final needle into hold on the left, the first needle will go back to work on the right. The rule of thumb when short rowing is to short row down to the point at which one third of the original stitches are still in work. In this case, I began with 31 stitches on each bed, which is a little bit unusual. But I did it to get a perfect fit. And I know that if I do that, I personally prefer a more developed heel to give me room for the high instep that I have. So I'm short rowing down 22 rows rather than the other options, which would be 20. Or some people would even go 18. But for me, this works better. There is some leeway. And you can tweak your short rowing pace to achieve the very best fit. When you see it being difficult to knit, like just then, it is because of that short rowing tightening the stitch where we place the needle in hold. It will knit off. It shouldn't be a problem. And the fact that it's snug means we probably won't have holes to deal with in our short rowed heels which is sometimes an issue for people when they use the manual wrapping method. As you may have noticed, it's usually not necessary to move the weights as frequently while short rowing out as it was while short rowing in. Nevertheless, always be very watchful that all the stitches, especially those towards the end of each row, are knitting. When we have knitted all of the stitches, it's a great idea to wrap the end stitch on the opposing bed. Here it comes. And that also cuts down on the tendency for a hole to form. That's the main yarn I'm using into the hook of the opposing needle. I really should have already done it on the right end and forgot, but that's okay. I can fix it later with just one stitch. It's not a big, huge deal. So we return to tubular or circular knitting settings and set the row counter to zero and now proceed with the foot just as the tube at the top of the sock was created. So we're back to easy peasy knitting. Always be watchful and don't go too fast, but this is quite straightforward. As I do this, let me talk a little bit about foot length because it's easily 
confusing, but it doesn't have to be. The total foot length is the length of your foot. So just say for argument, you're getting 10 rows per inch and you have 10 inch long feet. 10 times 10 is 100, but we multiply times two because of knitting tubular. But if you knit 200 rows on the counter, you have made it extra long because of forgetting to take into account the rows that the heel contributed to the length of the foot. In this case, that's 22 rows. So subtracting 22 from the total would give you the correct number. Here the correct number for me is 120. Before beginning to shape the toe, aiming for 140 in total. The toe shaping in this design is done by decreasing one stitch on each side of the work every two rows. That's each side and each bed, as you see me doing. Now knit two rows, that's one complete circuit, and repeat. It gives a nice toe shape, and a toe shaped with decreasing is a good bit easier for most machine knitters to manage than short rowing. Short rowing actually isn't difficult, but it's a skill that takes some practice that you tend not to be good at the first time. And by the time people attempt socks, they usually have decreasing well in hand. So this is a way of reducing the amount of stress. Also, we'll be able to close the toes nicely without Kitchener stitch, which is another area that people find challenging, though it does make a fabulous toe closure. When the final decrease is made, I'll knit two additional rows. That's one complete round. And then move all the remaining stitches that are on the front bed to the back bed. I have the alternative, if I wanted to, of scrapping off at the point that the decreases were finished and the last two rows, one round, was knitted. And then the end of the sock could be kitchener closed and it would be absolutely invisible. But in order to avoid needing to kitchener, we can use this method, which is transferring all front bed stitches to the back bed, and then we'll bind them off with the transfer method. It does show on the outside of the sock at the very end of the toe. And you might think it would be annoying but it's in a spot that most people find they don't even notice it. I feel quite finicky about socks, and this doesn't bother me at all. So if you want an alternative to the Kitchener closure, this is a good one. It's neat, and it's durable. And if you are old school and want to do Kitchener and are good at it, there's nothing stopping you from scrapping off instead of what I'm doing here and kitchenering from the scrap yarn. Binding off with the transfer method is ideal. I would caution you, especially on a machine like this that doesn't have gate pegs, in order to help you space your bind off. Don't make it too tight. If you do, eventually your toe will poke a hole in it, break the yarn, and it'll unravel, and so will the hole into the sock. So make sure not to distort matters. Now about now, I'm feeling all that weight on these few stitches that are left, and it's time to reach under there and remove the weights. The weight of the sock itself should be enough to keep the stitches from flying off the needles. So what we have is two stitches on each needle, and we're binding off and seaming the end of the toe at the same exact time. This will leave us with one yarn tail at the toe that needs to be bound in, I mean worked in. And I find that putting it in a yarn needle and working in and out of the decreases on whichever side the tail ends up, and then snipping it beyond that makes a nice finish that tends not to back out. There's what the decreases look like. There is what the seam at the end of the toe looks like. And there is what the short road heel looks like. I want to model the sock for you, so I'm going to need to snip my waist yarn open at the end. 
and this still leaves me the option of finishing that sock top in any way I want. I could just bind off and let the top roll. I could crochet an edge. I could work worm in, trim into it, or I could fold it over and make a hem top sock by back stitching or chain stitching it to the main sock fabric. Sizing your socks is actually simple math, but for those who feel that they're math impaired, this book has the math done in multiple gauges for foot sizes from infancy to extra large adult and can be a big time saver. It references American sizing, of course, but also European and UK sizing so all of my knitting friends around the world can use it. It's important to know what's involved in getting a matched pair of socks. Part of it is not up to you. It's up to the manufacturer and whether they do a super duper job of even space dyeing. The other part is on you. You must start each sock at the exact same place in the beginning of the color repeat. And sometimes that's long and not the easiest thing to find. It's worth the effort to take your time and be very certain. For this sample pair, I simply bound off the sock tops and am letting them roll. Because of the superior yarn and fit, they stay up just fine. Here's the information about the suggested row counts for each size as promised. I'm offering a written version of this pattern to Country Knitting of Maine News and Views magazine for those who enjoy reading it and referring to it in written form. The written pattern will have more sizes, probably going all the way up to ladies 11.